My name is Noel Smith. Um, my firm is Convex Asset Management. Basically what we are is we're trying to fill the gap between proprietary trading and hedge fund space. You know, when I look at the hedge fund space, I, I look at a lot of very boring returns. When I look at the proprietary space, I look at pretty ridiculously good returns and we're trying to kind of fill that void best we can. Convexity, let's define real quick as just a nonlinear payoff. So instead of, you know, two, four, eight, 16, we're more like, you know, two, four, eight, well, I guess we two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 30. What we do is we warehouse downside crash risk protection. So if the market crashes, we make money. It's not good for the world, but it's good for our book. What we do is we trade around that and we try to pay for those hedges because most of the time hedges lose money as the market goes up, you tend to just lose money on your hedges. So what we do is we have a nonlinear payoff always kind of embedded in our book so that our book really just can't blow up. There's just no ability for it to blow up. Well, we can lose money, but we have to lose money in other ways. A market crash is not one of those ways. So the idea with short selling is that, you know, you have a short position on an XYZ, uh, the stock is at $100, right? And uh, news comes out that XYZ is a fraud or, you know, it's cooking the books or something like that. And the, the stock goes from 100 to 50 in a heartbeat. Um, that is a very fast and very um, volatile event for that stock. And I think that that's what a lot of short sellers are looking for. Some number between, you know, where the stock is, has been shorted and zero. Um, so you want it to go down and you want it to go down fast. And I think that the asymmetry is what is really in play. So instead of a stock, you know, you're buying at 100 and watching it go to 101, 104, 106, you watch it go from 100, on the downside, to 20, and you're happy. Um, so from that perspective, that asymmetry, that convexity is the same thing we're looking at in terms of our options plays. We're looking for asymmetry in our trades, something that where there is an imbalance when we feel like we can collect some edge. I don't think it is just one macro force like, you know, the Fed is printing or interest rates are low. It is the confluence of market structure. Those things that I mentioned before, you know, there is low interest rates and that's causing the price of money to be relatively cheap. The velocity of money is very low. Um, there is a lot of reasons that volatility has compressed and there is kind of a uh, bimodal nature in the marketplace, which is really hearkening back to that asymmetry. So instead of having a normal distribution of a, um, you know, of a standard deviation, what you really have is more of a, more of a bimodal distribution, similar to like a, uh, an earnings event. Say Apple were to come out with, with earnings in a month, you know, you know Apple is priced at here right now. Well, it's not going to be right here right now in the, on the earnings date. It's going to be up here or down here. And that's what I mean by bimodal. It's not going to be in the middle. So that is probably a little bit more accurate in most instances. We use options as a risk mitigation tool and as a way to make decisions that we feel like have a better payoff in the stock market. If I buy Apple options, it's not that I think the, the options are necessarily always better than the stock, because if Apple goes up and it realizes volatility less than the options are pricing and I, I'm long calls, I'll lose money to those Apple options. Conversely, if Apple drops precipitously and realizes outside of its implied volatility, I'll make money on those Apple options. So it is really risk mitigation and option, options in general, I think are priced accurately. You know, the market making community is very smart and it's very difficult to you know, outsmart the collective wisdom of the marketplace. Um, but for me, I'm willing to trade some performance for lack of losses. It's my opinion that losses are more devastating to a book than gains are beneficial. You know, in, typically if you're, in the, if you're in the marketplace and the music is playing, if you're on the dance floor, it's probably fine. How people get really get hurt is if they have these whopper outside, outsized losses that they're just not equipped for, and then they can't recover. So for short sellers, you have several different problems. You have this, the natural drift of the stock market going up. You're going to have the natural litigation that comes with you pounding on a company's reputation. You're going to have overpriced puts once you go public with a short selling idea. So if, um, if XYZ is trading at $100 and the normal volatility for XYZ is 20 and you come out and say this company is a fraud, you know, within a minute or two or four, you're going to have volatility go to like 50 or 60 or something. And then if you want to buy out of the money puts and you are somewhat correct in the sense that the stock goes down 10%, you might not even make money on those puts. Um, conversely, if you decide to not participate in the options and you want to just go out and get the stock, you might have borrow issues or the borrow rate is going to, to change, or maybe you get those you know, shares called away from you at an inopportune time. 
So there is a you know spectrum of ways that things can go wrong for you in, this, in the short community. Most professional traders will have strong agreements in place with either their stock loan or their ability to trade. Uh, retail traders might find it more difficult. Um, but typically, if I'm going to short a name, I want to participate in the puts or if the puts are extremely high, sometimes I will sell upside call spreads. It's not as good. Um, it does not have that same convex payoff. And you know, your, your maximum gains are known at that point. But if you're gonna buy 120 vol in a name that is you know, probably worth 20 once it figures itself out, um, those puts might not make any money anyway. So it's better to maybe make you know, some volatility level in the options or the call options than buying the puts. Or if you can get the stock and you believe in your thesis and you're willing to really press those bets, then that can also be a good alternative. You know, I've been trading since uh, for 25 years now, and I've been standing in the audience watching my friends, associates, or colleagues uh, launch hedge funds, and I've continuously thought to myself that this could be done better. And in fairness to the hedge fund community, you know, running a $50 billion hedge fund, I don't know how to do that. That's a very, I, that's a very crazy number to throw around. If you want to go out and buy Apple calls and you have $50 billion to move around, it's going to be, you know, outsize the marketplace and everybody will know who you are and you won't make any money. So there is something between zero and a thousand, right? And if, um, you know, Millennium or Bridgewater or Citadel is a thousand and they have, you know, tens of billions of dollars and you have, you know, Joe Blow in his basement with, you know, $10,000, there's a huge difference between, you know, there's a whole lot of space in there. What smaller hedge funds, hedge funds can do, smaller being defined as maybe sub 500 million, is they can create probably much better returns um, with not just beta weighting the portfolio than a much larger firm. Now they can become a victim of their own success if they end up gathering you know, $10 billion and they're in the same problem you know, bucket with everybody else. Um, but small funds are much more nimble. They can do things They can change their thesis on a dime if they're in liquid products and they can just do stuff that large funds can't do. Conversely, you know, on the retail side, retail trading has never been better. The information, the ideas, the strategies, the, you know, just the amount of data that's out there has never been better. And some of the things that firms like mine or other competing firms were doing 20 years ago that were uber sophisticated are now something that you can buy off the rack. You know, you can kind of just Google the strategy, Google the data, and you can just figure it out if you're willing to put the time in. So, um, it's really a golden era for trading because a lot of firms, specifically market making firms, are doing extremely well right now. And retail traders, if they're savvy enough, can also do very well right now. So what we really look to do is very simple. We try to bring the best ideas from the prop world to our investors. So a lot of hedge funds will go out there and do a long short book, they're long Apple, they're short Tesla, and they hope for the difference. Um, our trades have nothing to do with that. We are totally different than those ideas. Some of the most sophisticated ideas that you see in the prop community in Chicago or New York, we're bringing those ideas and we're trying to, you know, not only beat the market, but beat the market with an embedded hedge so that our ability to blow out is non-existent. Information asymmetry is a funny thing because, you know, anything that's legal should be out there. So unless you're operating off a different set of information or you're getting information, quality information that's actionable more quickly, um, then it can be different. Short selling, I think, is a great business. Um, the idea that you're pounding on a company that doesn't have it coming, um, that might happen. But I think more often what happens is, you know, people tend to look at data, look at information that is in the public domain, and they do their homework. And they're providing a value, and they're keeping price discovery fair and accurate and honest. And moreover, they're putting their own money on the, on the line. So if you have, you know, a, a $100 million book and you're willing to spend or allocate $30 million to your short idea and you're wrong, that's the way it goes. But if you have $30 million and you have uncovered fraud and you know the marketplace is cleaner and more reliable as a result of your homework and you make money, everybody wins. So the idea that short sellers are this, you know, these evil people that are company crushers, um, I think that is more often than not inaccurate.